Hi, welcome to a little moment with Miss Odell. Um, I'm Chris Odell, and author of Miss Odell, my hard time, my long days and hard nights with the Beatles, the Stones, Bob Dylan, Eric Clapton, and the women they loved. Um, I'm happy to have you here today. I really have a couple subjects I want to talk about, but my intention is, of course, to tell you stories, and I hope that you're going to enjoy them. Just briefly, I uh, moved to London in 1968 and went to work for the Beatles at Apple, which at that time was Apple Corps Limited, but I was in the record division. And I was a Beatle fan. I mean, I got the albums as soon as they came out. I was, I heard something absolutely amazing that just made me, <coughs> excuse me, just made me want to yell and scream to everybody about it. I wanted to turn everyone on to it. And why I didn't think everybody was being turned on to it themselves, I don't know. I'm really not too sure about that. But anyway, um, I met Derek Taylor, who worked for them as their press agent in Los Angeles. I was introduced to him at a dinner one evening, and we became good friends. And Derek had a couple months left, or a month left, before he was going back to London to meet his family. And so, and he didn't drive. A lot of English people don't drive, and many people shouldn't drive. I've really come to that conclusion that a lot of people shouldn't drive. Um, but he didn't drive, so he asked me if I would drive him around. And I wasn't working in a job that I didn't care much for, so it didn't really matter. But I met so many people, and I learned so much about um, L.A., in the 60s, I mean, I, I, we'd go to dinners and I would be surrounded by people that were just so creative and so um, ambitious. And they were young. We were all fairly young, except maybe for Derek, who was in his 30s. Um, so that, that was a, a really nice introduction into Los Angeles at that time. And... He eventually did fly back to London and did go to work for Apple. And I um, I was kind of lost for a few days. It's like, what do you do? I was so used to having him around. And you had to know Derek to know why that would be true. He's just the kind of person, when you're with him, you feel like you're with the most special person in the world. His sense of humor, his... Um, cynicism, his liver puddling wit, um, just so much about him is, is just so, um, and, and he was like, I, I think I wrote that he reminded me of Errol Flynn. He just was sort of suave and debonair, not beetleish. You know, he had kind of long hair, but he was not your, you wouldn't have said, oh, that guy, he's like a beetle. No, you wouldn't have done that. But he was good friends with them. And it was the first time I'd ever heard anyone say a Beatle name in first person, like George or John, you know, and not go George Harrison, John Lennon. So it was kind of an interesting um, introduction into it. So after he left, I got myself another crazy job and moved in with a really lovely lady who was an aspiring actress at that time named Terry Garr. I met her through Derek at one of those amazing lunches and um, she needed a roommate and I needed a place to live. So I moved in with Terry. Thank goodness. I'm telling you, people ask me how these things happened. And I honestly say, I just kept saying yes. Every time someone asked me, did I want to do this? And it looked like it was going to be fun. I said, yes. So I moved in with her and she was great. She was working on different parts and studying and taking acting lessons. And she introduced me to some people that later would become, you know, pretty well known in the movie business, as well as her, of course. 
So while I was living with her, I got a call from Derek saying, would you like to come over to London? I think this would be a really good time for you to come. And, you know, I got to admit, in 1967, 68, people didn't just drop everything and fly internationally. It just wasn't done. So I was, you know, excited about the idea, but I didn't take it seriously. And then he called me again from New York when he was with John and Paul to talk about Apple, the opening of Apple and what it meant. You may, re may have seen it. I think Joe DiMaggio was the host. And um, uh, Derek called me from the plaza again and said, I really think this is a time you should come to London and get involved with Apple. You'd fit. I said, okay, thank you. And then I told Terry and Terry was like, you have got to do this. You have got to do this. She had been to London and had been in the restroom with Maureen, the same restroom at a club with Maureen. And she said, you've got to go. This is such a great experience. So after some talking and after some deep soul searching, I decided to, you know, kind of look into that. What did I have to do? And I had a friend that <clears throat> I worked with, <coughs> excuse me, at a distributorship named Jack Nelson. And Jack, um, he said, go. He knew somebody. He said, what have you got to sell? And I said, well, I have my record collection, which was extremely valuable to me at that time. And um, he said, well, I've got a friend who buys used records. So he got me about $100 for my record collection. Not a lot, but in those days, it was not a lot for a ticket either. And I called my parents in Tucson and told them that I'd made a decision to go to L.A. And they actually, I don't know if they believed me or to London. I'm not sure if they believed me or if they just were kind of going along with it. But in the end, my mother said, look, you've, we've got a little life insurance policy for you and we'll just turn that in and that should pay for your ticket. So much to my wonderment, um, I was really actually considering it. <laughs> and, and again, I can't tell you that with Terry constantly every day telling me all the, the good things that could happen, I finally decided, you know what? I think I will. So I dro drove back to Tucson, left my mom with my car, because I still owed on it, my Mustang, I think it was a 67 or 60, 66, 67 Mustang, left her with that, and sure enough, I flew to London. I think I flew to New York first and caught a BOAC flight, that was a British Airlines back then, and I, it was just the most exciting thing in the world to be on an airplane with English-speaking people. I mean, these people, I mean, well, I don't mean English-speaking, English-accented people. I mean, I was talking to this one guy sitting next to me, and he would say something or he'd hand me something. I'd go, oh, thank you. Or he'd do that, and I'd say, oh, you're welcome. And finally he said, you can quit saying you're welcome. We don't say that in England. And I went got to remember that. That's an important piece. Got to remember that. So I ended up arriving at Heathrow Airport early in the morning. Derek had suggested I go to the Hilton, but I don't think Derek really understood what my, um, my financial situation was. So I called the Hilton, and when I found out the prices, I went, no, that's not going to happen. So I, w I just went with some guy that was also traveling to London for the first time. was going to meet his parents in Spain or something. And we decided to go find a bed and breakfast, which we did. And as I think back now, it's just amazing what you can do when you're young. <laughs> anyway, we found a, a, that, a bed and breakfast and spent the weekend kind of roaming London and being tourists. And it was really exciting. I have to tell you. On the trip into London for the first time, I did not have a feeling of being in a foreign place. 
I absolutely felt I'd been there before. It was like home. I think we were on a bus or something from the airport. And I just went, oh, I know this. I've been here before. So anyway, on Monday, I gave Derek a call once I figured out how to use the phone, the pay phone. And he said, come on over. So I did. I got a taxi. And what I remember distinctly about that week um, was, well, first of all, it was trying to understand everything. It was exceedingly confusing, but it was being outside of the United States for the first time and, and watching people live their lives. You know, it, it was pretty astounding. Anyway, I showed up at Apple and the receptionist asked me what I she could do for me. And I said, well, I'm here to see Derek. And bless his heart, Derek came out and he just absolutely introduced me to everybody that was in the in the office and pulled me into his office and it was like I had entered a dreamland that one could not possibly imagine because if you weren't around in the 60s and you weren't part of that that whole scene of music loving you can't I mean the Beatles were English they were British they weren't Americans you know, I'd seen the Everly Brothers at a place in Tucson, and but they, it was like they were not, they didn't really exist. They were like these little characters we saw on TV. So I was pretty amazed to be able to just sit there and watch everything. And, um, and it wasn't long before Derek said, oh, that's Paul. And sure enough, I heard a voice in the office next door, which at that time was the Apple Boutique office. <clears throat> and so Derek got up and he went in and I was like, oh my God, Paul McCartney is in the same room as me. Or am I in the same room as him? Let's see. Anyway, Derek came in a short time later and I was absolutely expecting to see Paul, but I didn't. I saw Mala, or um, I saw Neil Aspinall, who was actually with John. So Derek introduced me to them, and then a short time later, Paul came came in. So I have to tell you, I was there for like no more than an hour and a half, and I had already met two of the four Beatles. And I mean, meet because I think Derek brought me into the situation and they trusted him so much, I feel pretty certain that that's why they trusted me from the very beginning. Um, they accepted that I was there. The offices weren't that huge. I mean, everybody knew everybody, but and lots of people came through, but Anyway, it was it was very comfortable. I guess it was comfortable. I don't know what that means back in those days. But anyway, that was my first experience at Apple. And my first day at Apple was pretty much just getting to know everybody and spending time with Derek. And, you know, I don't even remember if we went out to eat later or what we did. I have no memory of that. I was so overwhelmed by this introduction to this world that I couldn't have even imagined, couldn't have even imagined. And they served tea. They had a tea lady who came around every so often and offered you tea or coffee. It was like, Oh my God. And I mean, she worked there all day. She was back in the little kitchen. I thought this is the most quaint thing I'd, I've ever seen in my life. So I started getting into tea, trust me. And um, anyway, it, it just really briefly, it was, Apple was a flurry of energy, of activity. Everything was happening there it was and this was by the way I must backtrack a little and to tell you that this was at 95 Wigmore Street this wasn't Savile Row this was before Savile Row and Wigmore Street was this building 
that looked like any building in town. There was nothing special. It was other offices. They only had the one floor. I don't know how many floors there were at that time, but it was certainly over over five. So, um, you know, you walked you walked into the the big building at the very beginning, and there was the picture of the man who turned out to be Alistair Taylor, who could play all the instruments. Sort of, if I can if I can do it for Apple, so can you. It was something like that. I'll have to look into that a little bit. But anyway, that was basically um, the beginning of my life in that period of time. So I will continue with this and should have another, the next part of this out in probably a few days, certainly by next week at this time. And um, we're going to move on and see what else happened around that period of time. I am open to any questions. My email address is missodell at gmail.com. Please send me an email with any questions, any suggestions, um, pretty much anything that you might have to say as long as it's nice. It must be nice. So I appreciate you all tuning in and we'll catch up again later. Thank you. Remember, I wasn't famous. I wasn't almost famous, but I was there. Sure.